Welcome to the Voice of Counseling, presented by the American Counseling Association. This program is hosted by Dr. S. Kent Butler. This week's episode is the Black Male Experience Part 1 and features Dr. Michael Brooks. Welcome to the Voice of Counseling from the American Counseling Association. I'm Dr. S. Kent Butler, and joining us today is Dr. Michael Brooks. Michael Brooks is a counselor educator, a full professor at North Carolina A&T State University. He is a member of the doctoral faculty there in rehabilitation counseling. Dr. Brooks has served nationally on televised panels to offer his opinion regarding HIV and substance abuse. He has an extensive publication record in several counseling flagship journals, as well as publications in multicultural education and student affairs. Dr. Brooks has an edited textbook, Black Male Success, and has authored several book chapters. He has been the president of the Association for Multicultural Counseling and Development, and also the president of the Alabama Association for Counselor Education and Supervision. He serves as a faculty advisor for doctoral students in education and also in human, actually I'm saying that wrong and let me start all over again. He serves as faculty advisor for the Doctoral Student Association in the Human Development and Services Department. So with that, let me bring in Dr. Michael Brooks. How are you doing today, man? Fantastic. And thank you for the invitation uh, to dialogue with you. It's always good to uh, talk counseling with, with you, my friend, Kent Butler, President Butler. Yes, yes, yes. We've had many a conversation. And uh, one of the things that I knew coming into this presidency was that I wanted you to be a strong part of the conversation. And with that, you are a co-chair for the Black Male Experience uh, Task Force. And so what has that experience been like? And, you know, tell me a little bit about what you got going on right now. Yes. So, um, the experience has been, uh, it's ebbed and flowed with intensities. Um, it was, it, it's been good to galvanize those who are concerned about black men in counseling uh, under one focus. Um, it's, it's been tough though, in some ways, only because, you know, there's a, there's a looming sadness that that we only have the uh, the time of your presidency to take advantage of this light. Um, so you know, how do you maximize the opportunity, uh, make it important and impactful, uh, and and not be kind of like a Debbie Downer, but but understand that this this uh, could come to somewhat of a slowdown, I'm not gonna say a halt, but a slowdown, um, just because the next person in office may not have this type of emphasis. So uh, if I'm being truly honest, that's that's my ongoing sentiment. I'm constantly reminding the other co-chairs, hey, we only have a year. Um, we only have a year. I mean, a year in this particular light, again, I must specify that. The work that we do will will, will go on regardless of who is president of any organization, but this is a, a, a Luxor of light, if you will, to, uh, to get us moving. We can't squander the, the, the time. We can't, we can't let it fall by the wayside without getting at least the, the jump start on it so that it can kind of flourish in the future. I hear you. And I appreciate that because I think, that's a part of the vulnerability of it all. And that's also a part of bringing voice to what the situation is. And you're just saying that just now, it just adds to the point that there needs to be people at the table who will champion and take up the mantle of this concern to make sure that it stays in the forefront. And, and so, I hear you when you say that, you know, there's that ebb and flow and there's also that piece of the puzzle where it might kind of fall by the wayside. So thank you for that. For, for the sake of taking up the group that's that's on <clears throat> uh, what I call 
critical care or the group that's that's on life support. You know, you know, one of the things that we do is we tend to um, yank momentum. Okay, well, you're doing something for this group. What about that group? And you're doing something for that group. What about the third group? And we end up diluting the intentionality of the initial focus. You know, there, there's a particular population, black men, that are on life support. They're, they're, we, we are, in many ways, uh, thriving in spite of some serious circumstances. I don't want to say we're barely surviving. I'm, I'm trying to change narratives. Um, but we're thriving in spite of some very dire situations. So someone needs to have the wherewithal to always recognize that some groups may need more attention than others. I use this analogy. You live in a subdivision, I live in a subdivision. If a house catches on fire, the fire department goes and sprays the water on the house that's ablaze. The fire department doesn't come put water on all the houses in the subdivision. Some groups need more attention than others. So with that, what are some of the biggest threats you think to black males today? Just what I brought up, yeah. the, uh, the, the, the absence, the absent-mindedness, the overlooking, um, sometimes it's even our own um, inability to recognize that some groups just need attention and and that's not going to rob other groups of attention yeah i think a lot of times people say uh think that we want to be babied and that's not what black males want they want to be seen and heard and they want their humanness to be on the main stage as valid and relevant and and so a lot of times we get swept under the rug as being an afterthought you know Yes. And a lot of times I think we are assumed that because we're also men, that we'll be OK. Yeah. Um, we'll well, just in, a, in a real sense, we've been able to show resilience in being OK, but we haven't been OK. Right. I think I think we fake the funk in a very <laughs> serious way. Um, yeah. I, I, I think we show and prove in a, in a superficial way. When, when you peel back the onion layers, it's snub. No, this is not okay. And I think we've been, managed to outwardly survive or give the appearance of survival when it's really a hollow shell. So, Michael, from your perspective, how do we showcase that vulnerability without losing ourselves? Yeah. So, I think, I think. I think that's a great question. I, I think uh, counseling has to recognize that the one size fits all method just doesn't work. Okay. Um, you know, there, there are roughly 13 theories that are taught in the theories class. <laughs> yes. Each of the theories has relatively associated techniques that accompany them. None of those 13 theories in the history of counseling address Afrocentric phenomenon and ideologies. Hmm. Or, or at least none of them in the books that I've used. And so I have to bring in outside textbooks to talk about these things. In that, none of the techniques address how to engage with men of color, let alone oppressed people or people yes. who are survivors of the enslaved. Mm -hmm. More so, none of these techniques, none of these techniques overall, there, there may be some nuances, but none of them generally speak to men who suffer under these same living conditions and on top of that are additionally victimized, marginalized, and traumatized. So we are a very specific group and we desire some aspect of, of mainstream counseling that's going to address these specificities. When Hurricane Katrina came in 2005, K. Krep decided that we would have a better, stronger, systemic emphasis on trauma. The trauma became a part of the K. Krep standards. Black men have been getting shot by the police since God knows when, since the slave patrol. Yet there is no aspect of counseling that speaks to traumatized people, traumatized black people. 
uh, descendants of the enslaved. And so I think as you slowly funnel down, you'll hit some of these areas, but there needs to be an approach as to how to engage them in counseling. And we don't do that. So, you know, you said that just now, it made me think. So you talked about Katrina and you talked about sometimes that even being still a Band-Aid, right? Because even in that working with Katrina, there are intersectionalities of people, Black males being one of them, that is not being serviced, yet you still putting this Band-Aid on the Katrina aspect of it all. Right. And so, but I brought up, I brought up the natural disaster and Katrina in, in particular, because it showed that counseling as a profession can have a response. Have a Counsel- response. Counseling is very capable of responding to the needs of people. Wow. Um, I mean, we could we could go down the list. Mm-hmm. If you don't like black males, have a response to children who are traumatized by police shootings. Um, I mean, you 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 would get you you would be better positioned if you would respond to the needs of the populace. Right. Um, to deal with black males. I mean, some counselors are just gifted and able to make those adaptations. Right. So we are able to make it work. But across the board, um, as a profession, we just haven't done it publicly. We haven't put down a stake and said, we're going to do this. Let me ask you a question. Um, you brought up the 13 theories that we utilize. And, roughly. And, and roughly. And they're centuries, they're centuries old, some, uh, century old. Um, in, in some of them in regards to that. Are we shooting ourselves in the foot to think that that's the only way to counsel? And is there a need for um, a more current theory of choice that counselors can gravitate towards that will support what you're talking about in terms of working with different clientele? <clears throat> I'm sure there are ways to make the current structure work. I'm sure if K Krep just said, look, you need a black male, you need to address counseling. I'm a, I'll, I'll be selfish. You need to be, you need to speak to how you will address black males in counseling mm-hmm. and, and hear the standards. So we need to see your evidence of doing that. And people will find a way to make these 13 theories work. Um, I think as people of color, I think as BIPOC, we have long uh, acculturated ourselves to the traditional ideologies of counseling. Um, And I think there is a growing uh, uneasiness to acknowledge the Western ways of of thinking. Um, and, and And that probably would hit what you're saying, you know, are we shooting ourselves in the foot? Uh, I think we shoot ourselves in the foot by by limiting ourselves to just what I call the 13. I know I'm being facetious when I say that. Uh, and I, I think I think some of the textbooks kind of ram all the other uh, uh, more modern progressive the- uh, theories in like the last chapter. So, yeah. So, so you said something that, I, I'm, that I'm curious about. You you said k Krep and you use them as the um, the example what do you see as the role of ACA um, in that? Because there's got to be uh, a, a, f- a focus on um, what the counseling profession is. In some regards, I see KCREP as the, the, the group that, and, and other accrediting sources, as the group that comes in and ensures that these things are happening. But does ACA have any ownership in ensuring that this is what counselors should be doing and, and, and controlling the narrative, so to speak, on what it is that the counseling profession does? Yes, ACA does have ownership. Um, <clears throat> I mean, ACA is, is the you know, grandparent organization to counseling. So ACA can be the bridge between uh, what's traditional and what and what is. Mm-hmm. Um, so ACA can ACA can take on that role. ACA should take on that role. I think ACA has never been comfortable being controversial and being provocative, um, and, and that 
I think counselors to a certain degree are somewhat uneasy about being those things. So um, ACA in some ways reflects what its members or who its members are. So if, 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 if 15% or 10% of its membership are like, hey, we have issues. I think ACA will say, well, you know, we'll acknowledge it, but the majority of us may not feel that way. So Mike, what suggestions would you have for those counselors who have a desire to work with black males? Yes, um, what, I was, what I wanna say is one, I think they need to be somewhat, uh, it needs to, there needs to be an understanding that working with black males may not be a popular topic. Um, it may not be one that's gonna have a lot of flash. Um, so there needs to be some acknowledgement to the effort to kind of go places where people aren't necessarily gonna gather, but to understand that getting into the work of the, of the margins um, is sometimes just as important as, as working in the more popular areas. So I wanna just say that up front. The suggestions though, would be to uh, embrace all forms of masculinity, um, to, to not limit yourself to what one believes a black male is or could or should be. I think that's, I think that's how we got here, is, is, is by making uh, broad statements and broad assumptions about black males. Um, and then I, I think uh, it's almost as simple as, as the multicultural competencies and social justice, comp and social justice standards. Um, investigate your attitudes, beliefs, behaviors, and how these things manifest themselves uh, from a point of privilege or from a point of opportunity and, and, and make adjustments. What attitudes do you have about black men? What do you do to address those attitudes as a counselor? And then how do you infuse those into your counseling? What do you know about black men or about black culture? What do you, how do you demonstrate this outside of your counseling life? And then again, how do those, how, how does that knowledge infiltrate and play a place in your counseling practice? How much practice do you give to black men? Um, in all of our variety and differences. And can you tease that out a little bit? Because I, I mean, one of the things when you first said that, you know, the different intersectionalities that was in the black male, what do people need to be looking out for? I mean, can you kind of give a sense of that definition of what a black male is? Because I think a lot of times we do one dimensionalize a black male, right? Um, so what are the nuances of, of the black male from your perspective? You know, um, Everything from Virgil Abloh, you know, may he rest in peace, to Dennis Rotman, to Barack Obama, to the guy that cuts my hair. Um, I just think you need to remove the limits from what a black man can or cannot be. Okay. Um, but, well, so just let me ask you this. With the names that you just you just you just um, rattled off just now, people will stereotype the black male just from those names there. How that's dangerous. How do you separate and or move away from that and say, yes, I want you to be like a Barack Obama, like a Virgil. I want you to be like these individuals, but understand that they were complicated beings. Um, but that's why. But that's why I also mentioned the barbershop guy. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's why I also, and I, I tried to get away because I know those are famous people, but Virgil's in fashion. And you don't associate black men necessarily with fashion unless you know about the history of fashion, which I don't right. think a lot of people do. <laughs> um, uh, you know, Barack Obama's biracial. You know, we don't, but he identifies as a black man. So that makes him very complex and special at the same time. Um, so yeah, I, I see your point that there's there are complexities even within the popular black men, um, but we're not just all that. And so what comes with those guys, in particular, the Virgil and 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 Barry O, so to speak, 
is the assumption that we can all be that. But I don't know if we all want to be that. And, no, and so we shouldn't be counseled as that. Um, you know, I'm just as black as Allen Iverson. I know it doesn't mean I want to be him and I don't think he wants to be me. And so we shouldn't be treated necessarily as if we can be one another. We, we should be allowed to define who we are. We should be allowed to, uh, we should be treated as because we are defining who we are and accepted as such. Let me ask you a question. Do you see men from other intersectionalities being able to find themselves in that same narrative? Or, or are we seeing black males um, being isolated in that same narrative? Um, I think in some ways, men can be caught up in that same, that same box. Um, Tavis Smiley years ago once said, though, the difference is, you know, when white America catches a cold, black America gets pneumonia. So we don't, we don't have the same bounce back, if you will. Um, They're a typical type situation. Yeah. The impact, the impact or the, or, or the, or the levels to which we could suffer are a lot more extreme um, by being in this isolated place. I hear you. I hear you. So how does that kind of play out? So if you were to do a case scenario of, of a white male and a black male, what typically ends up happening in, in those privileged or marginalized spaces for either? It, 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 it starts at the beginning. It starts in the classroom. There are mm. conversations that, that somebody can have and they can see themselves being included in the conversation and, uh, and, and the other person would say, I have no place in this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly having to be uh, 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 bilingual in some ways. Don't see me. Uh, yeah, yeah, the invisible man. The, yeah. uh, what, what was it uh, Ellison? Yep. I, I, have to, I have to constantly just, I, I'm, I'm in the room, but you're not talking about me. You're not talking about anything that I relate to, I get what you're saying. Cause I, yeah. I, I see it. I, I may yeah. drive by it. Yeah. So can that, you break that down a little bit more because I hear it all the time. I don't know that people understand exactly what you just said just now. How do you break that down? I'm in the room. You, you don't see me and you don't bring me into the space. How, how, how do you kind of help people understand what that even th- feels like? So I'm wearing a shirt that says AT Aliens. Yep. Um, this is uh, Outkast's second album. Uh, it came out in 1996. Uh, probably was one of their pinnacle albums. If a professor even wants to broach the topic of hip hop, mm-hmm. um, typically it might be something of it's uh, a bridgeable genre to young people. And uh, it's exciting and it's moving and um, it, it's associated with partying. Whereas, and I may be a little uh, broad in my statement, the majority of black men, at least my age, I'll say it like that, will say hip hop is so much more than that. Hip hop is my mouthpiece. Hip hop is my lifeline. Hip hop is, is the way in which I have survived these horrible circumstances and made it uh, and, and gotten my voice out. Um, when did you fall in love with hip hop? Right. When did you fall in love with hip hop? I could tell you exactly when I fell in love with hip hop. <laughs> yes. Um, um, so, so, you know, hip hop is my coded language. Hip hop is, hip hop is so much more. So that's an example of someone kind of bringing up the topic Mm. And I really relate and and uh, embellish, yeah. but y- you're not going to hear that. You're not. Gonna- you can't build rapport there, because if if, you, if I talk to you about hip hop and I have no clue where your experience is or where you're coming from, and I try to connect with you there, and I'm so way off. Here you're talking about um, something that's coming from ATL uh, ATLians, and 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 I'm talking about hip hop to the hip, to the hip, to the hip, hip hop. Cause I can't connect with you in that space where you had those life experiences um, based on your, your experience with hip hop. It's one thing to not connect. It's another thing to not have the desire to connect. It's a third thing 
to think you connect when you have no idea. You have no idea. Your connection isn't even touching. <laughs> not even, <laughs> look at you. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's not even not even touching. Not even touching. Right. That's not even what is it kinesthetics or whatever that thing that little that little. Um, well, you know, if you have a positive and a negative and, <laughs> and it's strong enough, they'll yeah, read yeah. each other. You're actually yeah. magnets. You're actually magnets opposite of each other. Can't connect. Right. Wow. Wow. You said more than a word right there. Uh, so, so from the black male experience, you've just kind of acknowledged how, how multifaceted it is. Mm-hmm. Because even in that realm, you have black males who don't know anything about hip hop. They may not know anything about hip hop. They relate to it. But I mean, you know what I mean? From a yeah. different perspective, I'm trying to say, you know, yeah. everybody yeah. has a different way of coming to it. I, I, I don't I don't. That, that's a developmental issue. Yeah. Um, because, you know, hip hop is African hip hip. Uh, the beats that we use, the, the, the sampling, everything. I mean, you know, I mean, if you study music, you know that every genre of music was created by black folks. So hmm. uh, at least in America, I'll say that in America, every genre of music was created by black people. Uh, gospel, rock and roll, jazz, blues, R&B, rap. Um, uh, it, it, it all, it all, it, and the history shows it. So I'll, well, how you know, would you combat a person who tells you, no, that's not true? Read. <laughs> read. I mean, you know, you know, the, the slaves brought uh, spirituals over from Africa, which is the basis of gospel music. In the, in the, in the Mississippi Delta, um, blues music was created because it evolved from spirituals and it traveled down the Mississippi to New Orleans to Armstrong Park, which is the birthplace of jazz. Um, Chuck Berry took melodies from blues and converted them to rock and roll. He and Ray Charles together. Hip hop was created on Sedgwick Street in Queens in the basement of the YMCA um, where people took disco records and found the break beats and made them into songs. So that's how I know. Yeah. So, wow. And I can just tell you that, you know, I hear a lot of people talking about read and being discerning in your reading, right? Because there's a lot of literature out there. There's a lot of stuff that's out there. Some of it good, some of it bad, fiction and nonfiction, right? About mm -hmm. the black experience. But when you read, you need to be discerning of what it is that you're taking in and understanding that, you know, there's truth. There is, there is actual facts behind those statements that you just made about the music genre. In and of itself, I always I, I tell my students you need to you need to research who you're reading. Um, pe people people uh, need to have some type of uh, um, ombudsman or uh, uh, process to where they are given permission to speak, um, or they need to demonstrate why they are able to speak on these topics. Yes. So I, I I would say you need to vet. Who you allow into your brain. That's the perfect place for us to maybe take a segue and take a break. Um, I mean, that was deep, man. That yeah. was deep. Who you let enter into your brain space. Well, yeah. I mean, just because the flagship journal says, hey, you know, we published this document. I'm like, well, who is this dude? Who, 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 who are you? Who did you study under? Who did you... Uh, Who's in your ref who's in your references? Just just who are who are you influencing so I can allow you to influence me? Yeah. Yeah. Who who and also again, who are you influenced by so that I can allow you to even come into my space? Because that's right, because you can bring in a bunch of nonsense and then still be lost. Right. Wow. A perfect place to stop right now. And so thank you, Mike. Um, we're going to come back to this after the break. Uh, this is the Voice of Counseling, and I'm Dr. S. Kent Butler, and we're here with Dr. Michael Brooks, and we will be back with you shortly. Counselors help positively impact lives by providing support, wellness, treatment, 
we're working to change lives. We are creating a world where every person has access to the quality, professional counseling, and mental health services needed to thrive. Welcome back to The Voice of Counseling. This is Dr. S. Kent Butler, and we're here with Dr. Michael Brooks, um, who is at North Carolina A&T State University. He has been dropping not only beats, but the mic on so many different things that we've been talking about today. And I want to like segue into us talking about Black men in regards to the media. And so we talked about the hip hop piece of the Black male experience. Can you kind of talk about what you feel about the way young Black men and boys are portrayed in the media? Yeah. um, Well, years ago, uh, Jesse Jackson said that you don't see any positive Black images on primetime TV Mm -hmm. uh, from the hours of I think he said from five to nine or five to 11, something to that effect. Mm. So that begs the question, what images do you see? And then at 11 o'clock, you see the news with the bad images. Right, right. Or or a continuance of the bad images. Right, right. So that means you see us uh, in roles that you probably are very limiting. Uh, janitors, help, uh, criminals. Pimps. Uh, pimps. Yeah, all those things. So if my if my exposure to black people, let alone black males, is limited, then I'm going to base my opinions and assumptions on what I see on TV. So when you see someone like Kent Butler walking in your life, you're like, whoa, what, whoa, 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 what, what's what's this? This is different. Um, you know, and so you may think either Kent's the exception or we made a mistake or something because these images perpetuate for 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 years so 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 in that perpet- in that perpetuation are black males in your experience seen as harsh and hard and unapproachable i mean what what is the purpose of having the black male in all those negative sequences in media um if not to kind of make people fearful of them yeah. So you asked about the purpose. The purpose could yeah. be multifaceted. The purpose, okay. the purpose could be to, again, perpetuate stereotypes uh, and elevate certain groups while at the same time um, um, de-escalating other groups. Um, the, the purpose could, could just be this is an extension of my own reality as a producer or as a, as a creator. I mean, uh, Othello is is I think in all the Othello productions, he's only been portrayed as a black man once. Um, and I forgot who played him. But I remember James that Earl Jones, wasn't it? James Earl Jones? I think it was James Earl Jones. I, I could don't get me. Don't 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 yeah. quote me on that. Point is point is the, the same. Um there's there's an argument like no Othello wasn't black. You know, Othello was very black. Um so so we even we even have he was more black. He, we, yeah, we even have, or, or getting to the Moors, if you want to talk about uh, 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 black dynasties. But what ends up happening is the portrayal or lack of positive portrayal or even totality or comprehensive portrayals lead to us having to constantly uh, justify our existence and justify history and rewrite his or just correct history, not even rewrite it, just right. correctly tell it. Right. So and then we told that you are lying, lying, or um, you're, you're, you're skirting the issue or narrative or you're a rebel rouser or yeah. you are being difficult or anything. When in fact, it's like, no, I'm just telling you that what you're saying is not accurate. So that's that's the big picture. And then I think people give up. I think people get tired of just having to always have to correct, acknowledge, uh, ask questions on behalf of a certain group. And like, you know what, you know, just I'll just go ahead and be what you want me to be, because I'm tired of having to 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 stand up and challenge uh, uh, these these big entities. So so the media has taken black males and made them a stereotype and they made them bad, bad seeds, so to speak. 
And then every once in a while, then we get a character that comes on TV that's a doctor or a lawyer. But it's almost like we see Black males in our society, right? Um, how many PhDs do we have? We talk about this a lot, you and I. How many people who are actually medical doctors or lawyers out there, when you look at it from the actual percentage of people who are Black in America, and then um, the media then does that same thing, right? And so we don't have that presence of a male that brings that role model for Black youth to look at, to say, yes, that's, that's, that's who I see in my communities. That's who I know to be someone that I can become. If, if we're fortunate enough, yes, we, we might be able to. I mean, I went, I went to Morehouse College, mm-hmm. and thankfully, Morehouse, the whole entire uh, Morehouse uh, campus and surrounding areas challenged every stereotype that I could have imagined surrounding Black men. Uh, so you were able to get a much more broad and comprehensive understanding as to who we are from uh, late adolescence through late adulthood. Right. And it goes back to what you said earlier about you know, who are you listening to? Who are they referencing? Who is influencing them so that you can have that perspective as well? Yeah. That's a I mean, we, we, uh, you and I both uh, speak to Michael Purdy, uh, the, the cooking uh, uh, historical uh, culinary chef out of South Carolina. And I mean, it, there's just there's just there's just there are just so many layers to accurately portraying a group of people, um, and the lack of their portrayal could lead to further oppression or squandering of someone's ability to just want to be empowered. And right, and also it controls your narrative. And if you have somebody out there in the media that has everybody's attention, that's controlling your narrative and you not having any ability to put the real story out there. Um, that's why Ava, um, I'm not going to say her name right now. Gouvernet, right. Um, and Spike Lee's of the world. Remember, he had so much trouble trying to bring a narrative forward of what was happening in the black community. Um, when you don't have people who are forces like that who can then take and control, that's why it's important to have people at the table, right? And if you don't have those voices out there who are going to tell the true story, right? There's more Oprah Winfrey's in the world than the one that we see who is the billionaires. And, and but that's the I think that's part of the issue. You know, we live in capital in a capitalistic society, so we, we're also victims, if you will. Of, of being money hungry and thinking that's, that's the only way we can impact. Um, I don't know who's going to see this podcast, but this podcast will reach a lot more people than me walking through the streets in my hometown trying to get folks to listen. Um, and this podcast has more staying power. I'm sure there's an archive where if someone went to hear what we discussed, they can pull it and they can watch it and we re- watch it. Um, and so when you talk about coming to the table, we have to understand the power and impact in the work that we do. And sometimes, sometimes financial gain may have to take a, a somewhat of a backseat because work is not about financial gain. You really to, to try to bring forth a, a understanding of who we are as a black culture. It doesn't come from money. It comes from. Um, actually getting in and doing the work, right? It's right. putting it in there and, and making it have sustainable power and, and lasting power. And we have to be, we have to see the bigger picture to understand that. Wow. We have to understand that there, that there, what, something else needs to drive us. Hmm. And often it does, but again, talk about that in regards to black males coming together and understanding that we are behind this, um, this target. Talk, say it differently. Talk about what? Well, you know, all of us are not necessarily coming up at this with the, with the perspective that Michael Brooks just brought today. And so there are some people who are coming at it and they'll be oppositional to you in terms of how they see moving forward or they are content being where they are. 
So how do we bring all those voices to a table to help them see how society has really put black males at a disadvantage? That makes sense. I, I, I think so. I may not have the answer for that though, because I didn't come up quote unquote this way. Um, I just realized that the issues were bigger than me. Hmm. And I, I think I had a realization that if I don't speak to issues, and I'm not even sure if I'm doing it the best way. Uh, if, but if I don't at least try to speak to these issues, then I don't think many people will. That's talking about how you as a black male found your voice. Okay. And when you were able to take that stage, right? And when you were able to say, listen, I do have some influence well, here. Well, yes and no. Um, I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't have a desire to do scholarship in diversity, so to speak. I didn't, that, that was not my intent. Right. But I realized somewhere along the line that the work needed to be done. And if it didn't get done, more damage could continue. So, but I see that also as you had role models in your life. You talk about the Morehouse experience who showed you that there were other ways, right? right? Showed you that there was more than just basketball or being a star. Um, Cause you talked about that in terms of us gravitating towards money, right? So there are people who are looking at this limelight thinking that that's the only way that you can go there when there are so many other ways, multifaceted ways that black males have been able to find success and be successful with building families and structures that are strong and resilient, so to speak. Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, I got into counseling because I was angry with the treatment black people were receiving. Um, I, was at a I was at a crossroads kind of wondering, you know, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? And, I, and I, was, I just happened to be in this job where I saw counselors and I said, I don't think these people know what they're doing per se. I don't, I don't think they're connecting to these, these clients. Um, and I said, I could, I could probably do this uh, or at least be better at it than what I'm seeing. So yeah, I didn't have the, I didn't have the polish or I didn't have the ability to articulate how that would play out 25 years later. But um I think I think I don't know how you teach someone to be bothered and agitated by the way folks are treated yeah. and, and have an issue with that. I don't, I don't I don't know how to teach that. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. I do. Because it's deep it's because you're you're not the savior of us all. Right. Well, it's, and, it's, and, it's personal. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's why there's a certain level of seriousness. Um, to these topics because, you know, I, I have, I have children and I have relatives um, and they need to, I need to trust that the system that we create is going to include them um, and that they can receive proper services should they need them. Uh, I have friends. I mean, so it's personal to me. And I think that may be, if we asked, how do you, I think that's where it may come into play. Do you see, what we do as personal. Do you see these, the, are you personally concerned about people and how they are treated? And if you say that that's who you are and that's what you believe in, how do you let these atrocities and things that are happening to those individuals continue right. to, to kind of be at the forefront? Right, that, that's it right there, right there. Wow. So one of the things, and, um, you know, there's a lot of scholars that are out there who are helping to kind of bring forth narratives that are important. And sometimes we, in a sense, either embrace them or we, um, I guess the, the word of today is that we kind of, um, what's that? What do they do when people are um, kind of taken out of the limelight and- Cancel? Um, Cancel. There you go. I couldn't remember that word. So there are people who are out there who are doing these these things. Right. And we find ways to either support or to be disappointed by. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you brought up Tavis Smiley. Um, 
people feel a certain way about Cornell West. Um, people feel maybe a certain way about Ivy Tolson and, and, and Eric Michael Dyson and all those people who are out there spreading um, what they believe to be um, how to better improve the life experience of, of Black males. Al Sharpton is one name that comes forward. So we take those individuals and then we either build them up or we villainize them. What's your thoughts on what happens when we have these strong figures who are out there who are, as you said, being influenced by people who they have now taken and become an influencer um, with their way of life? Um, I think, uh, well, well, let me first respond to, to cancel culture. Yeah. Um, you know, cancel culture I think has morphed into something that's beyond a simple protest. Mm -hmm. I think you have to give people space to rehabilitate. And sometimes, you know, in cancel culture, you, you remove that, but also, you know, people are getting, are getting lamb blasted for things that they did decades ago, some tweet they did years ago, some, some party they went to, and it was a mistake. It was definitely a poor decision, but they are getting like railroaded. For they, don't get, they don't get to evolve. They don't, it's almost they, like the prison system, right? You send somebody to prison telling them that they're going to be rehabilitated so they can come back out, but yet when they come back out, you continue to use that experience that they went to the prison for to keep them from being able to find success. Yeah, but 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 I think that hurts people of color or BIPOC folks more than it does others. I remember Dick Cheney was, was staunchly against same-sex marriages until his daughter came out as a lesbian. Yeah. And, and then he said, well, I think, uh, I think I have a change in heart here, but there was no cancellation of Dick Cheney. Right. <laughs> so right. so I, I think, I think, uh, I think we need to find a better way to measure mistakes. Um, Hmm. And errors. Uh, I think we need to find a better way to send the message, but also allow space for rehabilitation. I mean, so if when you say that as a black male, it even has that much more of a resonance with me because people who make mistakes and try to atone to them, be able to have the space to it to find a better way of dealing with whatever it is that they have been dealing with. And we don't give them that. Yeah. I mean, get some help, get some help for, for folks, give them help. I mean, counseling is a great them. way. Mm -hmm. the counseling is one of the great ways that we can get them there. Exactly. exactly. But I guess, um, you know, Maya Angelou said, um, when someone shows you who they are, um, believe them the first time, right? First time. But, but I think there's, a, there's, there's got, according to what you're saying right now, there's also got to be a way to help them find another way to show you who they are. I mean, people show us who they are, and that may not be their ideal self, then there's, no, the place for there's no place for rehabilitation. Yeah. There's, there's no place for that. I mean, yeah. every... Not every, but many of the addicts that I know or have treated will clearly say that there is someone living in them that they don't like, but they need to somehow rehabilitate themselves so that they can deal with their internal desire and drive. Wow. Um, and they need space to do it. Yeah. That's good. That's, that's good. Um, and it just goes to show how deep all of this is and why it's important to have these difficult dialogues around all of this, because that's going to help us change our perspective and, and see the world differently. It doesn't mean that we have to agree, but it does mean that being open to hearing somebody else's narrative might give you a different perspective of how you see them in the world. Um, I also think I th um, if you understand that these issues are complex, then yeah. as counselor educators, we can't be about one size fits all, rush job, you know, sprint to the finish. Yeah. Uh, training programs. We we hmm. we have to somehow realize that we may need 
either more depth or more breadth to train our counselors, which I think feeds the other end. It makes counseling more exclusive. Um, wow. Again, um, mic drops from uh, Mike. Hey, Mike, look at that. Mike drops from Mike. Mike drops from Mike. There you go. All right. So um, we are coming to the end of our um, our conversation today, but I really appreciate you and have always appreciated you. One of the things that I think you and I go back and forth on, we grow on being able to be real and honest with one another um, and throw in different perspectives that we may have not been thinking about as we have trying to, um, to kind of navigate this life, right? Uh, especially as black counselor educators. And so I thank you, Michael Brooks, um, Dr. Michael Brooks, full professor, North Carolina A&T uh, State University. Um, you are the man. Um, again, say the name. How do you say the name of that shirt again? A.T. Aliens. It's the A.T. Aliens. A.T. Aliens. All right. A.T. Aliens. A.T. Aliens. Yep. And so um, we, you, you, you shared a way that we can kind of move forward understanding men from a different, especially black men from a different perspective. So this has been the voice of counseling. I am Dr. S. Kent Butler. Um, today we had the phenomenal Dr. Michael Brooks and we out for the day. And so thank you and we'll see you next time. ACA provides these podcasts solely for informational and educational purposes. Opinions expressed in these podcasts do not necessarily reflect the view of ACA. ACA is not responsible for the consequences of any decisions or actions taken in reliance upon or as a result of the information and resources provided in this program. This program is copyright 2022 by the American Counseling Association. All rights reserved.